Chapter 12 The prayer of our Lord in the garden and its mysteries, what his most blessed mother knew of it. 493 By the wonderful mysteries which our Savior Jesus had celebrated in the Cenacle, the reign which, according to his inscrutable decree, his eternal Father had consigned to him was well established, and the Thursday night of his Last Supper having already advanced some hours, he chose to go forth to the dreadful battle of his suffering and death by which the redemption was to be accomplished. The Lord then rose to depart from the hall of the miraculous feast, and also Most Holy Mary left her retreat in order to meet him on the way. At this face-to-face -face meeting of the Prince of Eternity and of the Queen, a sword of sorrow pierced the heart of son and mother, inflicting a pang of grief beyond all human and angelic thought. The sorrowful mother threw herself at the feet of Jesus, adoring him as her true God and Redeemer. The Lord, looking upon her with a majesty divine, and at the same time with the overflowing love of a son, spoke to her only these words, My mother, I shall be with thee in tribulation. Let us accomplish the will of the Eternal Father and the salvation of men. The great queen offered herself as a sacrifice with her whole heart and asked his blessing. Having received this, she returned to her retirement, where, by a special favor of the Lord, she was enabled to see all that passed in connection with her divine Son. Thus, she was enabled to accompany him and cooperate with him in his activity, as far as devolved upon her. The owner of the house, who was present at this meeting, moved by a divine impulse, offered his house and all that is contained to the Mistress of Heaven, asking her to make use of all that was his during her stay in Jerusalem and the queen accepted his offer with humble thanks. The thousand angels of her guard and forms visible to her, together with some of the pious women of her company, remained with the lady. 494. Our Redeemer and Master left the house of the Senegal with all the men who had been present at the celebration of the mysterious supper, and soon many of them dispersed in the different streets in order to attend to their own affairs. Followed by his twelve apostles, the Lord directed his steps toward Mount Olivet, outside and close to the eastern walls of Jerusalem. Judas, alert in his treacherous solicitude for the betrayal of his divine master, conjectured that Jesus intended to pass the night in prayer as was his custom. This appeared to him a most opportune occasion for delivering his master into the hands of his confederates, the scribes and the Pharisees. Having taken this dire resolve, he lagged behind and permitted the master and his apostles to proceed. Unnoticed by the latter, he lost them from the view and departed in all haste to his own ruin and destruction. Within him was the turmoil of sudden fear and anxiety, interior witness of the wicked deed he was about to commit. Driven on in the stormy hurricane of thoughts raised by his bad conscience, he arrived breathless at the house of the high priests. On the way it happened that Lucifer, perceiving the haste of Judas in procuring the death of Jesus Christ, and as I have related in chapter 10, fearing that after all Jesus might be the true Messiah, came toward him in the shape of a very wicked man, a friend of Judas acquainted with the intended betrayal. In this shape Lucifer could speak to Judas without being recognized. He tried to persuade him that this project of selling his master did at first seem advisable on account of the wicked deeds attributed to Jesus, but that having more maturely considered the matter, he did not now deem it advisable to deliver him over to the priests and the Pharisees, for Jesus was not so bad as Judas might imagine, nor did he deserve death, and besides, he might free himself by some miracles and involve his betrayer into greater difficulties. 495. Thus Lucifer, seized by new fear, sought to counteract the suggestions with which he had previously filled the heart of the perfidious disciple against his author. He hoped to confuse his victim, but his new villainy was in vain, for Judas, having voluntarily lost his faith and not being troubled by any such strong suspicions as Lucifer, preferred to take his master's life rather than to encounter the wrath of the Pharisees for permitting him to live unmolested. Filled with this fear and his abominable avarice, he took no account of the counsel of Lucifer, although he had no suspicion of his not being his friend, whose shape the devil had assumed. Being stripped of grace, he neither desired nor could be persuaded by anyone to turn back in his malice. The priests, having heard that the author of life was in Jerusalem, 
had gathered to consult about the promised betrayal. Judas entered and told him that he had left his master with the other disciple on their way to Mount Olivet, that this seemed to be the most favorable occasion for his arrest, since on this night they had already made sufficient preparation and taken enough precaution to prevent his escaping their hands by his artifices and cunning tricks. The sacrilegious priests were much rejoiced and began to busy themselves to procure an armed force for the arrest of the most innocent lamb. 496. In the meanwhile, our divine Lord with the eleven apostles was engaged in the work of our salvation and the salvation of those who are scheming as death. Unheard of and wonderful contest between the deepest malice of man and the unmeasurable goodness and charity of God. If this stupendous struggle between good and evil began with the first man, it certainly reached its highest point in the death of the repairer. For then, good and evil stood face to face and exerted their highest powers. Human malice in taking away the life and honor of the Creator and Redeemer, and his immense charity freely sacrificing both for men. According to our way of reasoning, it was, as it were, necessary that the most holy soul of Christ, yea, that even his divinity, should revert to his blessed mother, in order that he might find some object in creation in which his love should be recompensed, and some excuse for disregarding the dictates of his justice. For in this creature alone could he expect to see his passion and death bring forth full fruit. In her immeasurable holiness did his justice find some compensation for human malice, and in the humility and constant charity of this great lady could be deposited the treasures of his merits, so that afterwards, as the new phoenix from the rekindled ashes, his church might arise from his sacrifice. The consolation which the humanity of Christ drew from the certainty of his blessed mother's holiness gave him strength, and as it were new courage to conquer the malice of mortals, and he counted himself well recompensed for suffering such atrocious pains by the fact that to mankind belonged all his most beloved mother. 497. All that happened the great lady observed from her retreat. She perceived the sinister thoughts of the obstinate Judas, how he separated himself from the rest of the apostles, how Lucifer spoke to him in the shape of his acquaintance, and all the rest that passed when he reached the priests and helped them to arrange with so much haste the capture of the Lord. The sorrow which then penetrated the chaste heart of the Virgin Mother the acts of virtue which she elicited at the sight of such wickedness and what else she then did cannot be properly explained by us. We can only say that in all she acted with the plenitude of wisdom and holiness and with the approbation of the Most Holy Trinity. She pitied Judas and wept over the loss of that perfidious disciple. She sought to make recompense for his malice by adoring, confessing, praising, and loving the Lord whom he delivered by such fiendish and insulting treachery. She offered herself with eagerness to die in her son's stead if necessary. She prayed for those who were plotting the capture and death of her divine lamb, for she regarded them as prizes to be estimated according to the infinite value of his precious lifeblood, for which the most prudent lady foresaw they would be bought. 498. Our Savior pursued his way across the torrent of the, the Kedron, to Mount Olivet and enter the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he said to all the apostles, Wait for me and seat yourselves here while I go a short distance from here to pray. Do you also pray in order that you may not enter into temptation? The Divine Master gave them this advice in order that they might be firm in the temptations of which he had spoken to them at the supper, that all of them should be scandalized on account of what they should see him suffer that night that Satan would assail them to sift and stir them up by his false suggestions, for the pastor, as prophesied, was to be ill-treated and wounded, and the sheep were to be dispersed. Then the master of life, leaving the band of eight apostles at the place, and taking with him St. Peter, St. John, and St. James, referred to another place where they could neither be seen nor heard by the rest. Mark 14.33 Being with the three apostles, he raised his eyes up to the Eternal Father, confessing and praising him as was his custom 
which interiorly he prayed in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah, permitting death to approach the most innocent of men and commanding the sword of divine justice to be unsheathed over the shepherd and descend upon the God-man with all its deathly force. In this prayer, Christ our Lord offered himself anew to the Eternal Father in satisfaction of his justice for the rescue of the human race, and he gave consent that all the torments of his passion and death be let loose over that part of the human being which was capable of suffering. From that moment, he suspended and strained whatever consolation or relief would otherwise overflow from the impassable to the passable part of his being, so that in this dereliction his passion and sufferings might reach the highest degree possible. The Eternal Father granted these petitions and approved this total sacrifice of the sacred humanity. 499. The prayer was, as it were, the floodgate, through which the rivers of his sufferings were to find entrance, like the resistless onslaught of the ocean, as was foretold by David, Psalm 68, 2. And immediately he began to be sorrowful and feel the anguish of his soul, and therefore said to the apostles, My soul is sorrowful unto death. As these words and the sorrow of Christ our Lord contain such great mysteries for our instruction, I will say something of what has been shown me, and as far as I can understand concerning them. The Lord permitted this sorrow to reach the highest degree both naturally and miraculously possible in his sacred humanity. This sorrow penetrated not only all the lower faculties of his human life, insofar as his natural appetites were concerned, but also all the highest faculties of his body and soul, by which he perceived the inscrutable judgments and decrees of the divine justice and the reprobation of so many, for whom he was to die. This was indeed by far the greater source of his sorrow, as we shall see farther on. He did not say that he was sorrowful on account of his death, but unto death, for the sorrow naturally arising from the repugnance to the death he was about to undergo was a minor fear. The sacrifice of his natural life, besides being necessary for our redemption, was also demanded as a return for the joy of having in his human body experienced the glory of the transfiguration. On account of the glory then communicated to his sacred body, he held himself bound to subject it to suffering, deeming that a recompense of what he had received. This we see verified also in the three apostles, who were witnesses as well of the glorious as of the sorrowful mystery. This they themselves now understood, being informed thereof by a special enlightenment. 500. Moreover, the immense love of our Savior for us demanded that full sway be given to this mysterious sorrow. For if he caused it to stop short of the highest which that sorrow was capable of, his love would not have rested satisfied, nor would it have been so evident that his love was not to be extinguished by the multitude of tribulations. Canticle 8.7 At the same time, he showed thereby his charity toward the apostles, which were with him and were now disturbed by perceiving that his hour of suffering and death, which he had so often and in so many ways foretold them, was now at hand. This interior disturbance and fear confounded and confused them without their daring to speak of it. Therefore the most loving Savior sought to put them more at rest by manifesting to them his own sorrow unto death. By the sight of his own affliction and anxiety, they were to take heart at the fears and anxieties of their own souls. There was still another mystery contained in the sorrow of the Lord, which referred especially to the three apostles, St. Peter, James, and John. For more than all the rest, they were imbued with an exalted conception of the greatness and divinity of their master, as far as the excellence of his doctrine, the holiness of his works, and the power of his miracles were concerned. They realized more completely and wondered more deeply at his dominion over all creation, in order that they might be confirmed in their belief of his being a man capable of suffering. It was befitting that they should know, as eyewitnesses, his truly human sorrow and affliction. By the testimony of these three apostles, who were distinguished by such favors, the Holy Church was afterwards to be well fortified against the errors which the devil would try to spread against the belief in the humanity of Christ our Savior. Thus would the rest of the faithful have the consolation of this firmly established belief in their own affliction and sorrow. 501. Interiorly enlightened in this truth, the three apostles were exhorted by the author of life by the words, Wait for me, watch and pray with me. He wished to 
inculcate the practice of all that he had taught them and to make them constant in their belief. He thereby reminded them of the danger of backsliding and of the duty of watchfulness and prayer in order to recognize and resist the enemy. Remaining always firm in the hope of seeing his name exalted after, after the ignominy of his passion. With this exhortation, the Lord separated himself a short distance from the three apostles. He threw himself with his divine face upon the ground and prayed to the Eternal Father. Father, if it is possible, let this chalice pass from me. This prayer Christ our Lord uttered, though he had come down from heaven, and with the express purpose of really suffering and dying for men, though he had counted as not the shame of his passion, had willingly embraced it, and rejected all human consolation, though he was hastening with most ardent love into the jaws of death to affronts, sorrows, and afflictions, though he had set such a high price upon men, that he determined to redeem them at the shedding of his life blood. Since by virtue of his divine and human wisdom, and in his inextinguishable love, he had shown himself so superior to the natural fear of death, that it seems this petition did not arise from any motive, solely coming from himself. That this was so in fact, was made known to me in the light which was, which was vouchsafed me, concerning the mysteries contained in this prayer of the Savior. 502. In order to explain what I mean, I must state that on this occasion Jesus treated with the Eternal Father about an affair, which was by far the most important of all, namely, in how far the redemption gained by his passion and death should affect the hidden predestination of the saints. In this prayer, Christ offered on his part to the Eternal Father his torment, his precious blood, and his death for all men, as an abundant price for all the mortals and for each one of the humans born to that time and yet to be born to the end of the world, and on the part of mankind he presented the infidelity, ingratitude, and contempt with which sinful man was to respond to his frightful passion and death. He presented also the loss which he was to sustain from those who would not profit by his clemency and condemn themselves to eternal woe, though to die for his friends and for the predestined was pleasing to him and longingly desired by our Savior. Yet to die for the reprobate was indeed bitter and painful, for with regard to them the impelling motive for accepting the pains of death was wanting. This sorrow was what the Lord called a chalice, for the Hebrews were accustomed to use the word for signifying anything that implied great labor and pain. The Savior himself had already used this word on another occasion, when speaking to the sons of Zebedee he asked them whether they could drink the chalice which the Son of Man was to drink. This chalice then was so bitter for Christ our Lord, because he knew that his drinking it would not only be without fruit for the reprobate, but would be a scandal to them, and redound to their greater chastisement and pain, on account of their despising it. 1 Corinthians 1 23 503 I understood therefore that in this prayer Christ besought his Father to let this chalice of dying for the reprobate pass from him. Since now his death was not to be evaded, he asked that none, if possible, should be lost. He pleaded that as his redemption would be superabundant for all, that therefore it should be applied to all in such a way as to make all, if possible, profit by it in an efficacious manner. And if this was not possible, he would resign himself to the will of his eternal Father. Our Savior repeated this prayer three times at different intervals. Matthew 26:44 pleading the longer in his agony in the view of the importance and immensity of the object in question. Luke 22:43. According to our way of understanding, there was a contention or altercation between the most sacred humanity and the divinity of Christ. For this humanity and its intense love for men, who are of his own nature, desired that all should attain eternal salvation through his passion, while his divinity in its secret and high judgments had fixed the number of the predestined, and in its divine equity could not concede its blessings to those who so much despised them, and who of their own free will made themselves unworthy of eternal life, by repelling the kind intentions of him who procured and offered it to them. From this conflict arose the agony of Christ, in which he prayed so long, and in which he appealed so earnestly to the power and the majesty of his omnipotent and eternal Father. 504. This agony of Christ our Savior grew in proportion to the greatness of his charity and the certainty of his knowledge, that men would persist in neglecting to profit by his passion and death. Luke 
His agony increased to such an extent that great drops of bloody sweat were pressed from him, which flowed to the very earth. Although this prayer was uttered subject to a condition and failed in regard to the reprobate who fell under this condition, yet he gained thereby a greater abundance and secured a greater frequency of favors for mortals. Through it, the blessings were multiplied for those who placed no obstacles. The fruit of the redemption were applied to the saints and to the just more abundantly, and many gifts and graces of which the reprobate made themselves unworthy were diverted to the elect. The human will of Christ, conforming itself to that of the divinity then, accepted suffering for each respectively, for the reprobate as sufficient to procure them the necessary help if they would make use of its merits, and for the predestined as an efficacious means of which they would avail themselves to secure their salvation by cooperating with grace. Thus was set in order, and as it were realized, the salvation of the mystical body of his holy church, of which Christ the Lord was the creator and head. 505. As a ratification of this divine decree, while yet our master was in his agony, the Eternal Father for the third time sent the Archangel Michael to the earth in order to comfort him by a sensible message and confirmation of what he already knew by the infused science of his most holy soul. For the angel cannot tell our Lord anything he did not know, nor could he produce any additional effect on his interior consciousness for this purpose. But as I related above, Christ had suspended the consolation which he could have derived from his human nature from this knowledge and love, leaving it to its full capacity of suffering, as he afterwards also expressed himself on the cross. In lieu of this alleviation and comfort which he had denied himself, he was recompensed to a certain extent, as far as his human senses were concerned, by this embassy of the archangel. He received an experimental knowledge of what he had before known by interior consciousness for the actual experience in something superadded and new and is calculated to move the sensible and bodily faculties. St. Michael, in the name of the Eternal Father, intimated and represented to him in audible words what he already knew, that it was not possible for those to be saved who were unwilling, that the complacence of the Eternal Father in the number of the just, although smaller than the number of the reprobate, was great, that among the former was his most holy mother, a worthy fruit of his redemption, that his redemption would also bear its fruits in the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, virgins, and confessors, who should signalize themselves in his love and perform admirable works for the exaltation of the name of the Most High. Among these, the angel moreover mentioned some of the founders of religious orders and the deeds of each one. Many other great and hidden sacraments were touched upon by the archangel, which it is not necessary to mention here, nor have I any command to do so. And therefore, what I have already said will suffice for continuing the thread of this history. 506. During the intervals of Christ's prayer, the evangelists say he returned to visit the apostles and exhorted them to watch and pray, lest they enter into temptation. This the most vigilant pastor did in order to show the dignitaries of his church what care and supervision they were to exercise over their flocks. For if Christ, on account of his solicitude for them, interrupted his prayer, which was so important, it was in order to teach them how they must postpone other enterprises and interests to the salvation of their subjects. In order to understand the need of the apostles, I must mention that the infernal dragon, after having been routed from the cenacle and forced into the infernal caverns, was permitted by the Savior again to come forth, in order that he might, by his malicious attempts, help to fulfill the decrees of the Lord. At one fell swoop, many of these demons rushed to meet Judas, and in the manner already described, to hinder him, if possible, from consummating the treacherous bargain. As they could not dissuade him, they turned their attention to the other apostles, suspecting that they had received some great favor at the hands of the Lord in the Cenacle. What this favor was, Lucifer sought to find out, in order to counteract it. Our Savior saw this cruelty and wrath of the Prince of Darkness and his ministers, Therefore, as a most loving father and vigilant superior, he hastened to the assistance of his little children and newly acquired subjects, his apostles. He roused them and exhorted them to watch and pray against their enemies in order that they might not enter unaware and unprovided into the threatening temptation. 507. He returned, therefore, to the three apostles who, having been more favored, also have more reasons for watchfulness and imitation of their master. 
but he found them asleep, for they had allowed themselves to be overcome by insidious disgust and sorrow, and in it had been seized by such a remissness and lukewarmness that they fell asleep before speaking to them or waking them. The Lord looked at them for a moment and wept over them, for he saw them oppressed and buried in this deathly shade of their own sloth and negligence. He spoke to Peter and said to him, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? And immediately he gave him the others the answer, Watch ye and pray, that you enter not into temptation. Mark 14.37 For my enemies and your enemies sleep not as you do. That he reprehended Peter especially and was not only because he was placed as head of the rest, and not only because he had most loudly protested that he would not deny him and was ready to die for him. Though all the others should be scandalized in him and leave him, but also because Peter, having from his whole heart made freely these protests, deserved to be corrected and admonished before all the rest. For no doubt, the Lord chastises those whom he loves, and is always pleased by our good resolutions even when we afterwards fall short in their execution, as happened with the most fervent of all the apostles, St. Peter. When the Lord came the third time and woke up all the twelve, Judas was already approaching in order to deliver him into the hands of his enemies, as I shall relate in the next chapter. 508. Let us now return to the Cenacle, where the Queen of Heaven had retired with the holy women of her company. From her retreat by divine enlightenment, she saw most clearly all the mysteries and doings of her most holy son in the garden. At the moment when the Savior separated himself with the three apostles, Peter, John, and James, the Heavenly Queen separated herself from the other women and went into another room. Upon leaving them, she exhorted them to pray and watch, lest they enter into temptations. But she took with her the three Marys, treating Mary Magdalene as the superior of the rest. Secluding herself with these three as her most intimate companions, she begged the Eternal Father to suspend in her all human alleviation and comfort, both in the sensitive and in the spiritual part of her being, so that nothing might hinder her from suffering to the highest degree in union with her Divine Son. She prayed that she might be permitted to feel and participate in her virginal body all the pains of the wounds and tortures about to be undergone by Jesus. This petition was granted by the Blessed Trinity, and the Mother, in consequence, suffered all the torments of her Most Holy Son in exact duplication, as I shall relate later. Although they were such that if the right hand of the Almighty had not preserved her, they would have caused her death many times over. Yet, on the other hand, these sufferings inflicted by God himself were like a pledge and a new lease on life. For in her most ardent love, she would have considered it incomparably more painful to see her divine son suffer and die without being allowed to share in his torments. 509. The three Marys were instructed by the queen to accompany and assist her in her affliction, and for this purpose they were endowed with greater light and grace than the other women. In retiring with them, the most pure mother began to feel unwanted sorrow and anguish, and she said to them, My soul is sorrowful because my beloved son is about to suffer and die, and has not permitted me to suffer and die of his torments. Pray, my friends, in order that you may not be overcome by temptation. Having said this, she went apart a short distance from them, and following the Lord in his supplications, she as far as was possible to her, and as far as she knew it to be conformable to the human will of her son, continued her prayers and petitions, feeling the same agony as that of the Savior in the garden. She also returned at the same intervals to her companions to exhort them, because she knew of the wrath of the demon against them. She wept at the perdition of the foreknown, for she was highly enlightened in the mysteries of eternal predestination and reprobation. In order to imitate and cooperate in all things with the Redeemer of the world, the Great Lady also suffered a bloody sweat, similar to that of Jesus in the garden, and by divine intervention, she was visited by the Archangel St. Gabriel, as Christ, her son, was visited by the Archangel Michael. The Holy Prince expounded to her the will of the Most High in the same manner as St. Michael had expounded it to Christ, the Lord. In both of them, the prayer offered and the cause of sorrow was the same, and therefore they were also proportionately alike to one another in their actions and in their knowledge. I was made to understand that the most prudent lady was provided with some cloths for what was to happen in the passion of her most beloved son, and on this occasion she sent some of her angels with a towel to the garden in which her son was then perspiring blood in order to wipe off and dry off 
his venerable countenance. The Lord, for love of his mother and for the greater mayor, permitted these ministers of the Most High to fulfill her pious and tender wishes. When the moment for the capture of our Savior had arrived, it was announced to the three Marys by the sorrowful mother. All three bewailed this indignity in the most bitter tears, especially Mary Magdalene, who signalized herself in tenderest love and piety for her master. Instruction which Mary the Queen of Heaven gave me. 510. My daughter, all that thou hast understood and written in this chapter will serve as a most potent incentive to thee and to all the mortals who will consider it carefully. Estimate then and weigh within thy soul how important in the eternal predestination or reprobation of the souls, since my most holy son looked out upon it with such great anxiety that the difficulty or impossibility of saving all men added such immense bitterness to the death which he was about to suffer for all. By this conflict he manifests to us the importance and gravity of the matter under consideration. He prolonged his supplications and prayers to his eternal Father, and his love for men caused his most precious blood to ooze forth from his body, on perceiving that the malice of men would then m make unworthy of participation in the benefits of his death. The Lord, my Son, has indeed justified his cause in thus having lavished his love and his merits without measure for the purchase of man's salvation. And likewise, the Eternal Father has justified himself in presenting to the world such a remedy and having made it possible for each one freely to reach out for such widely different lots as death and life, fire and water. 5.11 But what pretense or excuse will men advance for having forgotten their own eternal salvation when my divine Son and I have desired and sought to procure it for them with such sacrifices and untiring watchfulness? None of the mortals will have any excuse for their foolish negligence, and much less will the children of the Holy Church have an excuse, since they have received the faith of these admirable sacraments, and yet show in their lives little difference from that of infidels and pagans. Do not think, my daughter, that it is written in vain. Many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 20.16 Fear this sentence, and renew in thy heart the care and zeal for thy salvation, conformable to the sense of obligation arising from the knowledge of such high mysteries, even if it were not a question of eternal salvation for thee, thou shouldst correspond to the loving kindness with which I manifest to thee such great and divine secrets. Then I shall call thee my daughter and a spouse of my Lord, should cause thee to pay no attention to any visible thing and embrace only love and suffering for his sake. This I have shown thee by my example since I applied all my faculties continually to these two things with the highest perfection. In order that thou mayest attain this, I wish that thy prayer be without intermission, and that thou watch one hour with me, that is, during the whole of thy life, for compared with eternity life is less than one hour, yea, less than one moment. With such sentiments I wish that thou follow up the mysteries of the passion, writing them, feeling them, and imprinting them upon thy heart. Chapter 13 our Savior is delivered into the hands of his enemies by the treason of Judas, and is taken prisoner. The behavior of the Most Holy Mary on this occasion, some of the mysteries of this event. 5.12 While our Savior occupied himself in praying to his Father for the spiritual salvation of the human race, the perfidious disciple Judas sought to hasten the delivery of Christ into the hands of the priests and the Pharisees. At the same time, Lucifer and his demons not being able to divert the perverse will of Judas and of the other enemies of Christ from their designs on the life of Christ their creator and master, changed the tactics of their satanic malice and began to incite the Jews to greater cruelty and effrontery in their dealings with the Savior. As I have already said several times, the devil was filled with great suspicions lest this most extraordinary man be the Messiah and the true God. He now resolved to ascertain whether his misgivings were well-founded or not by instigating the Jews and their ministers to the most atrocious injuries against the Savior. He imparted to them his own dreadful envy and pride, and thus literally fulfilled the prophecy of Solomon, Wisdom 2.7. For it seemed to the demon that if Christ was not God and only a man, he certainly must weaken and be conquered in the persecutions and torments. If, on the other hand, he was God, he would manifest it by freeing himself and performing new miracles. 5.13 
Similar motives urged on the priests and Pharisees. At the instigation of Judas, they hastily gathered together a large band of people, composed of pagan soldiers, a tribune, and many Jews. Having consigned to them Judas as a hostage, they sent this band on its way to apprehend the most innocent lamb, who was awaiting them, and who was aware of all the thoughts and schemes of the sacrilegious priests, as foretold expressly by Jeremiah 11.19. All these servants of malice, bearing arms, and provided with ropes and chains and the glaring torch and lantern light, issued from the city in the direction of the Mount Olivet. The prime mover of the treachery, Judas, had insisted upon so much precaution, for in his perfidy and treachery, he feared that the meekest master, whom he believed to be a magician and sorcerer, would perform some miracle for his escape. As if arms and human precautions could ever have availed if Jesus should have decided to make use of his divine power. As if he could not have brought this power into play in the same way as he had done on the other occasions should he now choose not to deliver himself to suffering and to the ignominies of the cross. 5.14 While they were approaching, the Lord returned the third time to his apostles, and finding them asleep, spoke to them, Sleep ye now, and take your rest. It is enough, the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Behold, he that will betray me is at hand. Mark 14, 41. Such were the words of the Master of Holiness to the three most privileged apostles. He was unwilling to reprehend them more severely than in this most meek and loving manner. Being oppressed, they did not know what to answer their Lord, as Scripture says, Mark 14, 40. They arose, and Jesus went with them to join the other eight disciples. He found them likewise overcome and oppressed by their great sorrow and fallen asleep. The master then gave orders that all of them together, mystically forming one body with him their head, should advance toward the enemies, thereby teaching them the power of mutual and perfect unity, for overcoming the demons and their followers, and for avoiding defeat by them. For a triple cord is hard to tear, as says Ecclesiastes 4.12, and he that is mighty against one may be overcome by two, that being the effect of the union. The Lord again exhorted all the apostles and forewarned them of what was to happen. Already and confused, noise of the advancing band of soldiers and their helpmates began to be heard. Our Savior then proceeded to meet them on the way, and with incomparable love, magnanimous courage, and tender piety prayed interiorly. O sufferings, longingly desired from the inmost soul, ye pains, wounds, affronts, labors, afflictions, and ignominious death, Come, come, come quickly, for the fire of love, which burns for the salvation of men, is anxious to see you meet the innocent one of all creatures. Well do I know your value. I have sought, desired, and solicited you, and I meet you joyously of my own free will. I have purchased you by my anxiety and searching for you, and I esteem you for your merits. I desire to remedy and enhance your value and raise you to highest dignity. Let death come in order that by my accepting it without having deserved it, I may triumph over it and gain life for those who have been punished by death for their sins. I give permission to my friends to forsake me, for I alone desire and am able to enter into this battle and gain for them triumph and victory. Isaiah 53.3 5.15 During these words and prayers of the author of life, Judas advanced in order to give the signal upon which he had agreed with his companions, namely the customary but now feigned kiss of peace, by which they were to distinguish Jesus as the one whom they should single out from the rest and immediately seize. These precautions the unhappy disciple had taken, not only out of avarice for the money and hatred against his master, but also on account of the fear with which he was filled for he dreaded the inevitable necessity of meeting him and encountering him in the future if Christ was not put to death on this occasion. Such a confusion he feared more than the death of his soul or the death of his divine master, and in order to forestall it, he hastened to complete his treachery and desired to see the author of life die at the hands of his enemies. The traitor then ran up to the meekest lord and as a consummate hypocrite, hiding his hatred, he imprisoned on his countenance the kiss of peace 
saying, God save thee, master. By this so treacherous act, the perdition of Judas was matured, and God was justified in withholding his grace and help. On the part of the unfaithful disciple, malice and temerity reached their highest degree. For interiorly denying or disbelieving the uncreated and created wisdom by which Christ must know of his treason and ignoring his power to destroy him, he sought to hide his malice under the cloak of the friendship of a true disciple. And all this for the purpose of delivering over to such a frightful and cruel death his creator and master, to whom he was bound by so many obligations. In this one act of treason he committed so many and such formidable sins that it is impossible to fathom their immensity, for he was treacherous, murderous, sacrilegious, ungrateful, inhuman, disobedient, false, lying, impious, and unequaled in hypocrisy. And all this was included in one and the same crime, perpetrated against the person of God made man. 516. On the part of the Lord shone forth his ineffable mercy and equity. Since those words of David were fulfilled in an eminent manner, with them they hated peace. I was peaceable. When I spoke to them, they fought against me without cause. Psalm 119.7 So completely did the Lord fulfill this prophecy that when in answer to the kiss of Judas, he said, Friend, whereto art thou come? He sent into the heart of the traitorous disciple a new and most clear light, by which Judas saw the atrocious malice of his treason, the punishment to follow, if he should not make it good by true penitence and merciful pardon still to be obtained from the divine clemency. What Judas clearly read in those few words of Christ was, Friend, take heed, lest thou cause thy perdition and abuse my meekness by this treason. If thou seek my friendship, I will not refuse it to thee on account of this deed as soon as thou art sorry for thy sin. Consider well thy temerity in delivering me by false friendship and under cover of a false peace and a kiss of reverence and love. Remember the benefits thou hast received by my charity, and that I am the son of the virgin by whom thou hast been so often favored and rejoiced with motherly advice and counsel during thy apostolate. Even if it were only for her sake, thou shouldst not commit such a treason as to sell and deliver her son. In no wise does her loving meekness deserve such an outrageous wrong, for she has never been unkind to thee. But although thou hast now committed this wrong, do not despise her intercession, for she alone will be powerful with me, and for her sake I offer thee pardon and life, since she has many times besought me to do so. I assure thee that we love thee, for thou art yet in life, where there is hope and where we will not deny thee our friendship, if thou seek it. But if thou refuse it, thou wilt merit our abhorrence and eternal chastisement and pain. The seed of the divine words took no root in the heart of the unhappy reprobate. It was harder than adamant and more inhuman than that of a wild beast. Resisting the divine clemency, he finally fell into despair, as I shall relate in the next chapter. 517. The signal of the kiss, having been given by Judas, the Lord, with his disciples and soldiers, who had come to capture him, came face to face, forming two squadrons, the most opposed and hostile that ever the world saw. From the one side with Christ, our Lord, true God and man, as the captain of all the just, supported by his eleven apostles, the chieftains, and the champions of his church, with innumerable hosts of angelic spirits, full of adoring wonder at this spectacle. On the other side were Judas, the originator of the treason, filled with hypocrisy and hatred, and many Jews and Gentiles bent on venting their malice with the greatest cruelty. Surrounding these were Lucifer and a multitude of demons, inciting and assisting Judas and his helpers, boldly to lay their sacrilegious hands upon their Creator. With unfathomable love for suffering and great force and authority, the Lord then spoke to the soldiers, saying, Whom seek ye? John 18:45. They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. John said to them, I am he. By this inestimably precious and blessed words, Christ declared himself as our Redeemer and Savior. For only by his offering himself freely to redeem us by his passion and death could our hope of eternal life ever rest on firm foundation. 5.18 His enemies could not understand or fathom the true meaning of these words. I am he. 
But his most blessed mother and the angels understood them, as did also to a great extent the apostles. It was as if he said, I am who am, Exodus 3.14, as I have said to my prophet Moses, for I am of myself and all creatures having their being and existence from me. I am eternal, immense, infinite, one in substance and attributes, and I have made myself man, hiding my glory, in order that by means of my passion and death, to which you wish to condemn me, I might save the world. As the Lord spoke with divine power, his enemies should not resist, and when his words struck their ears, they all fell backwards to the ground. John 18.6 This happened not only to the soldiers, but to the dogs, which they had brought with them, and to the horses on which some of them rode. All of them fell to the ground and remained motionless like stones. Lucifer and his demons were hurled down with them, deprived of motion and suffering new confusion and torture. Thus they remained for some seven or eight minutes, showing no more signs of life than if they died. O word of a God, so mysterious in meaning and more than invincible in power, let not the wise glory before thee in their wisdom and astuteness, nor the powerful in their valor. Jeremiah 9.23 let the vanity and arrogance of the children of Babylon be humbled, since one word from the mouth of the Lord, spoken with so much meekness and humility, confounds, destroys, and annihilates all the pride and power of man in hell. Let us, children of the church, also learn that the victories of Christ are gained by confessing the truth, by giving place unto wrath, Romans 12, 19, by showing meekness and humility of heart, Matthew 11:29, by overcoming and being overcome with dove-like simplicity, by the peacefulness and resignment of sheep free from resistance of furious and ravenous wolves. 519. Sadly, our divine Lord contemplated the picture of eternal damnation exhibited in them and listened to the prayer of his most holy mother, to let them rise, for upon her intercession his divine will had made that dependent. When it was time for them to come to themselves, he prayed to the eternal Father, saying, My Father and eternal God, in my hands thou hast placed all things. John 13.3 and has consigned to me the redemption required by thy justice. I wish to satisfy it and give myself over to death with all my heart, in order to merit for my brethren participation in thy treasures and the eternal happiness held out to them. By this expression of his efficacious will, the Lord gave permission to that whole miserable band of men, demons and animals, to arise and be restored to the same condition as before their falling down. A second time the Savior said to them, Whom seek ye? And they again answered, Jesus of Nazareth. The Lord answered, Most meekly, I have already told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. John 18.8 8. With these words he gave permission to the servants and the soldiers to take him prisoner and execute their designs, which without their understanding it meant nothing else than to draw upon his divine person all our sorrows and infirmities. Isaiah 53, 4, 520. The first one who hastened to approach in order to lay his hands upon the master of life was a servant of the high priests named Melchus. In spite of the fear and consternation of all the apostles, St. Peter, more than all the rest, was roused with zeal for the defense and the honor and life of the divine master. Drawing a cutlass, which he had with him, he made a pass at Melchus and cut off one of his ears, severing it entirely from the head. John 18:10. The stroke would have resulted in a much more serious wound if the divine providence of the master of patience and meekness had not diverted it. The Lord would not permit that any other death than his own should occur at his capture. His wounds, his blood, and suffering alone should rescue to eternal life the human race, as many of it as are willing. Nor was it his will, or according to his teaching that his person be defended by the use of arms. And he did not wish to leave such an example in his church as one to be principally imitated for her defense. In order to confirm this doctrine which he had always inculcated, he picked up the severed ear and restored it to its place, perfectly healing the wound and making Melchus more sound and whole than he ever was before. But he first turned to St. Peter and reprehended him, saying, Put thy sword into the scabbard, for all that shall take it to kill with it shall perish. Dost thou not wish that I drink the chalice which my father hath given me? Thinkest thou that I cannot ask my father, and he will give me presently many legions of angels for my defense? But how then shall the scriptures and the prophets be fulfilled? John 18.11, Matthew 26.53 5.21 Thus St. Peter, the head of the church, 
by this loving exhortation, had been taught and enlightened that his arms for the establishment and defense of the church were to be spiritual, and that the law of the gospel does not inculcate battles and conquests with material weapons, but conquests of humility, patience, meekness, and perfect charity, which overcome the demon, the world, and the flesh, that divine virtue would triumph over its enemies and over the power and intrigues of this world, that arms for attack and defense were not for the followers of Christ our Savior, but for the princes of the earth to safeguard their earthly possessions, while the sword of the church was to be spiritual, reaching rather the soul than the body. Then Christ our Lord, turning toward his enemies and the servants of the Jews, spoke to them with great majesty and grandeur. You are come, as it were, to a robber with swords and clubs to apprehend me. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you laid not hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. All the words of our Savior contain the profoundest mysteries, and it is impossible to comprehend them all or explain them, especially those which he spoke at his passion and death. 5.22 well might those ministers have been softened and made ashamed of their wickedness by the reprehension of the divine master. But they were far from it, because they were of the accursed and sterile earth, drained of the dew of virtue and human kindness. Nevertheless, the author of life wished to admonish them of the truth to that extent. Thereby their malice would be so much the more inexcusable, and this sin and all the others committed in the very presence of the highest holiness and justice would have its due correction, and they themselves a powerful help for conversion, if they should desire it. Moreover, it would thereby become evident that he knew all that was to happen, that he delivered himself into their hands and over to this death of his own free will. For these and for many other sublime reasons, the Lord spoke the above words, penetrating their inmost mind. For he knew and fully understand the cause of their malice, hatred, and envy, namely because he had publicly reprehended the vices of the priests and Pharisees, because he had taught the truth and the way of life to the people, because he had by his example and his miracles captured the goodwill of the humble and the pious and brought many sinners to his friendship and grace. He reminded them that one who had power to bring about all these results in public and who could not be apprehended in the temple or in the city in which he taught, could certainly not be captured in the open field without his consent. He clearly made them sensible that the reason of their failing to do so before was because he himself had not given his permission to men or demons until the hour chosen by himself. In order to signify to them that the hour of his being captured, ill-treated, and afflicted had come, he said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. As if he had said to them, Until now it was necessary for me to be with you as your master for your instruction. Therefore I did not permit you to take my life, but I desire to consummate by my death the work of the redemption consigned to me by my eternal Father. And therefore I now permit you to take me prisoner and to execute your will upon my person. Thereupon they fell upon the most meek lamb, like fierce tigers, binding him securely with ropes and chains, in order thus to lead him to the house of the high priest, as I shall presently relate. 5.23 The most pure mother of Christ our Lord was most attentive to all that passed in his capture, and by means of his clear visions saw it more clearly than if she had been present in person. For by means of her supernatural visions, she penetrated into all the mysteries of his words and actions. When she beheld the band of soldiers and servants issuing from the house of the high priest, the prudent lady foresaw the irreverence and insults with which they would treat their creator and redeemer. And in order to do what was within her power, she invited the holy angels and many others in union with her to render adoration and praise to the Lord of creation as an offset to the injuries and affronts he would sustain at the hands of those ministers of darkness. The same request she made to the holy women who were praying with her. She told them that her most holy son had now given permission to his enemies to take him prisoner and ill-treat him, and that they were about to make use of this permission in a most impious and cruel manner. Assisted by the holy angels and the pious women, 
the faithful queen engaged in interior and exterior acts of devoted faith and love, confessing, adoring, praising, and magnifying the infinite deity and the most holy humanity of her creator and lord. The holy women imitated her in the genuflections and prostrations, and the angelic princess responded to the canticles, with which she magnified, celebrated, and glorified the divinity and humanity of Christ. In the measure in which the children of malice increased their irreverence and injuries, she sought to compensate them by her praise and veneration. Thus, she continued to placate the divine justice, lest it should be roused against his persecutors and destroy them, for only Most Holy Mary was capable of staying the punishment of such great offenses. 524. And the great lady not only placated the just judge, but even obtained favors and blessings from the divine clemency for the very persons who irritated him, and thus secured a return of good for those who were heaping wrongs upon Christ the Lord for his doctrine and benefits. This mercy attained its highest point in the disloyal and obstinate Judas, for the tender mother, seeing him deliver Jesus by the kiss of a feigned friendship, and is considering how shortly before his mouth had contained the sacramental body of the Lord, with whose sacred countenance so soon after those same foul lips were permitted to come in contact, was transfixed with sorrow and entranced by charity. She asked the Lord to grant new graces, whereby this man who had enjoyed the privilege of touching the face whereupon angels desire to look might, if he chose to use them, save himself from perdition. In response to this prayer of the Most Holy Mary, her son and Lord granted Judas powerful graces in the very consummation of his treacherous delivery. If the unfortunate man had given heed and had commenced to respond to them, the Mother of Mercy would have obtained for him many others, and at last also pardoned for his sin. She has done so with many other great sinners, who were willing to give that glory to her, and thus obtain eternal glory for themselves. But Judas failed to realize this, and thus lost all chance of salvation, as I shall relate in the next chapter. 525. Likewise, when the great lady saw all the servants and the soldiers who had come to take him fall to the ground at his divine word, she in company with the angels broke out in a song of praise of his infinite power and of the virtue of his humanity, which thereby renewed the victory of the Most High over Pharaoh and his troops in the Red Sea. Exodus 15.4 She exalted the Lord of hosts because he was about to deliver himself in an admirable manner to suffering and death in order to save the human race from the captivity of Lucifer. Then she besought the Lord to permit all these dumbfounded and vanquished enemies to regain their senses and to arise. She was moved to the petition by her most generous kindness and deep compassion for these men, created by the Lord according to his own image and likeness. On the other hand, she wanted to fulfill in an eminent degree the law of loving our enemies and doing good to those who persecute us inculcated and practiced by her own son and master, Matthew 5.44. And finally, because she knew that the prophecies of Holy Scripture were to be fulfilled in the redemption of man, although all these were infallible, this did not hinder the Most Holy Mary from giving voice to her prayer, and thereby moving the Most High to grant these favors. For in the infinite wisdom and in the decrees of his eternal will, all these means were foreseen as producing these effects in the manner most conformable to the foreknowledge and foresight of the Lord. But it is not necessary to enter into the further explanation of such mysteries at present. When the servants of the high priest laid hands on and bound the Savior, the Most Blessed Mother felt on her own hands the pains caused by the ropes and chains, as if she herself was being bound and fettered in the same manner she felt in her body the blows and torments further inflicted upon the Lord. For I have already said this favor is granted to his mother, as we shall see in the course of the Passion. 